Uh, good evening, folks. Thanks very much for coming out for the CIS on entrepreneurship. Uh, we have, at the moment, six old boys with one hopefully to come, uh, and they will speak to you about their experiences of uh, business and their journey to this point this evening. Um, we are live streaming. It's our, our new thing. That's right, come through. Um, and there is a few competing sort of things on tonight, so I know that there's soccer on, uh, probably some music type stuff as well. So um, there will be a recording of this up on YouTube if you want to go back and have a look at anything later. Uh, but we'll start proceedings this evening with Nathaniel Bibby. Thank you, Nathaniel. Thanks very much. Um, so uh, my entrepreneurial journey um, started with a series of, of uh, failed startups, really. Um, I've always darted in and out of sales. I studied marketing at uh, UWA after I finished at Hale in 2001. And uh, yeah, a lot of marketing graduates, not a whole lot of marketing jobs, so I ended up in sales and found that the best salespeople were the ones that managed to generate the best quality leads. So I, I started learning about online marketing. It was quite interesting. I never learned about online marketing at university, but um, after I left university, that's pretty much all I did to get more cu customers. And uh, about eight years ago, uh, recognized an opportunity on a social media platform called LinkedIn, which is for business professionals. Is there anybody in the room by show of hands it's on linkedin just curious okay cool so there's 640 million members on the platform worldwide now it's growing at two members per second um so uh there's a lot of opportunity there for career prospects as well as um you businesses using it to to do business with other um, companies and so that's basically what my business does is it helps um, businesses get more clients through LinkedIn. So five, 10 years ago, uh, businesses used to call up a business to speak to a key decision maker. They would find it reasonably easy to get a hold of the um, key decision maker within an organization, make it past the gatekeeper. Um, whereas these days, uh, that doesn't work anymore. The days of interrupting people with advertising doesn't work. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, entrepreneurial uh, skill set. I think, you know, um, I think with entrepreneurism, especially in my experience, it's been basically learning as I go. I've l definitely learned a lot through every failure um, and I've learned a lot through every success as well. And I think that, um, you know, at a young age, I it was a bit like when you go to, the, to um, an ice cream shop and, you know, I wanted to try every single flavor. I learned a lot along the way, tried a lot of different things until I found out what I was passionate about. And then I found that when you find um, something that you are passionate about, um, you're willing to put in the effort to make it succeed. You know, I started my business when I was $20,000 in debt. Um, I was, uh, hadn't been paid in three months for my job. I'd lost my job. I, got, I was uh, getting evicted from my apartment. Um, wrote my business plan under a desk lamp beca uh, because I didn't have any electricity in my apartment. I had to connect two extension cords and then plug them into a uh, power socket in the stairwell of my apartment block uh, just to get the, the light on so I could write my business plan. And then the first day in business, we made 15 grand in sales. And like um, ever since then, I've, I've kind of um, had this not no fear attitude, but definitely um, lean into risk a lot more. And I think that's essential if you're going to be an entrepreneur, especially, you know, if you're doing it without any finance behind you. Um, so resilience, um, grit, I think, um, and also being able to think outside the box. Um, so my advice would, would be to any, um, you know, young, young person thinking about um, moving into entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur is just to try uh, your hand at different things and find out what you, you enjoy doing, what you're passionate about, where there's an opportunity that you can add value. Because um, business really at the end of the day, in my view, is, is all about adding value. Um, a lot of people get into it um, to make money or to uh, get more free time. It doesn't really work out uh, like that when you focus on those things. Uh, but if you focus on adding value, your uh, money does tend to attract towards uh, where value is provided. Um, so what else can I tell you about being an entrepreneur? Um, I guess one of the other things is uh, 
being innovative is very important. Uh, so in business, like marketing and innovation are basically the, the two most important things when it comes to definitely a business in the startup um, period. And um, I, throughout my career, I've definitely uh, innovated consistently. It hasn't worked uh, all the time. It's probably not worked more than it has. Um, but the, the times that it has, I've doubled down. And uh, I'll give you an example. So on the social media platform, LinkedIn, when they introduced video marketing, uh, I started a series where I'd interview various entrepreneurs and I've had a few, um, well, quite a number of uh, big, big sort of named celebrities that have come down from the US that I've managed to interview because of the following I've got on LinkedIn. And uh, just got back from Sydney uh, two nights ago where I picked up the um, LinkedIn Marketer of the Year Award. Um, so like I literally found this, you know, I was the first uh, guy to own a marketing agency that specialized in LinkedIn in Australia. So it really was, um, you know, pioneering an industry. And at the moment, there's so much change going on. That there's a lot of opportunity around, in, especially in social media and technology. I've heard the buzzer, so that's me. Uh, thanks for listening. Good evening. Um, funny enough, there's a lot of uh, similarities with Nathaniel there, and um, my my um, I feel quite um, uh, you know quite humbled to be up here tonight because honestly, uh, my business is quite a small family business where I left school, left Hale, halfway through year twelve. Strangely enough, just doing in those days my TAE, and um, the I took my mother's car in for its service, and I was becoming a mechanic. I like doing things with my hands. I enjoyed in, in those days at Hale, we had to work as you guys do. We, were, um, we still had a junior certificate, so we had to actually pass year 10. We were kicked out in those days. Had to get through year 11, same thing, and then uh, got through to year 12. And then uh, this opportunity came up that I took my mum's car in for service, stayed there for the day. And in fact, I stayed there for 10 years. I, um, I loved what I did and I was passionate about the motor trade. I wasn't so sure that I would stay on the tools all that time. Um, so what I I suppose did was took advantage of um, the, pro the, pro the, the product that I was with, which was fortunate, was with BMW. So we were dealing in the right market um, and also with re very good clients. I noticed that um, people liked their cars, believe it or not, they were right into their cars. And um, I decided that I wanted to move through the industry, off the tools, into sales, and then set up my own business and a point of difference, and that was to really be um, the one-stop shop was just BMW basically and then Mercedes-Benz and it grew and as you do you've got to innovate, you've got to move with the times, people change and in those days it was the biggest European brand in Western Australia. In fact in, the, in the 1991 we had the world launch for one of the products in little old Perth because um, we were the number one per capita BMW dealer in, in the world. So I uh, moved through, set up my own place 20 years ago and I suppose my entrepreneurial side of it saw that you know you had to believe in what you did, and um, and I had that always had that have a go attitude. I adapted, um, I adapted our business continually to look after our clients, and I could see that they wanted hands-on, specialised sort of servicing, and they wanted to be looked after and maintained, and they didn't want to be running here or there. They're all busy people, so I basically offered the old-fashioned service where they could come into our place and we could take care of anything of that motor vehicle. And um, I suppose uh, that made it easy for them because they're all having a busy lifestyle and that's continued on today uh, where we do the complete bumper to bumper. So that's something different. Most places don't do all those sort of bits and pieces and the people don't want that. They want that our clients, very loyal clients. We very rarely lose a client. It's a service business so it's difficult. So you've got to continually work to maintaining them, you've got to move with the times, things change rapidly. But some of the things that I think that uh, made us successful is um, yeah, I've always had great knowledge of the industry, I've believed in the industry, i always involved in the industry and spent eight years in the Motor Trade Association where I was president. Um, these are all givebacks to your industry that are important. Um, sat on the government advisory board, we rewrote the legislation, it took eight years, that's great if you've had anything to do with uh, dealing with government, some of the parents in here, um, that's a difficult process. It's, it's the Act was in fact written in 1974, it took us 12 years to redo it. 
and uh, finally it's just coming through now. Um, what we tried to do, as I said, was to try and make a, um, a niche market, which we successfully did with European vehicles. As we did, we moved on from BMW because you do have to continually evolve. Um, we, we're, we're strong believers in training, and I think that's important. In, um, if, you're, if you're looking at a business or trying to run a business, you've got to support your staff, and it, there's got to be plenty of give back. Um, and I think some of the other things, um, you've got to work out what works and what doesn't work. And as Nathaniel was saying, you know, you've got to have a go. And if you get knocked down, you just get back up again and try something different. Uh, learn from your mistakes. And I think if you've all, if you've read the book of um, Branson's book, um, man, he tried so many things and he got knocked for six that many times. And uh, look where he is today. And he's just one of the most inspirational books you could read. Um, we, I suppose, we have that approach where we're very hands-on and we're continually changing where um, we're in touch with our clients on a regular basis. Whatever you do, with whatever we do with our clients or whatever they're due for servicing or any maintenance items or things are changing, we're totally, we're always in front of them. And a lot of that's now with social media, we spoke about, um, and that's, that's something that's that's evolving and that's changed. Uh, that changes, you know, it almost seems like on a weekly basis, but you've just got to continue um, evolving, I suppose is the word. Um, I suppose uh, also for us, um, yeah, taking risks, as I said, is important, although I probably took a way more conservative approach over the years, um, which, has been it's been good for us um, where I know certainly other people in our industry have taken extreme risks and it hasn't paid off and now with the market you know you, the market's so competitive now and it's all driven by electronic um, intervention basically you just keep evolving with that um, it's probably really um, all I've got to say um, I think the main thing is, as I was saying, is you've really just got to believe in yourself um, and you need to have that have a go attitude and just learn from your mistakes. Don't be afraid to make mistakes and continually, continually have a go and continually evolve. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Nick and uh, um, I come to this lecture theatre when I was at Hale, I left in 1989, we used to have our Parry House uh, meetings in here, it's um, been refurbished, uh, Dave was a good Parry House man uh, and his brother Lincoln was in my year. Um, I, I left in 1989 and um, I, was, I was just an okay student I think, I, I enjoyed most of the subjects I did. Um, maths, English, Lit were, were a couple I, I enjoyed, but I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do after school, but uh, I had a bit of a family background. Uh, my father was involved in some different um, small or private businesses, and uh, I used to have work um, with him even on, on weekends, and I, I guess I always had some sense maybe uh, that, that was a path I might go down, um, <coughs> but I left school and did a business degree um, thinking that that might be an okay general um, course to study and maybe give me some skills that might be useful for a few different things. And as I got going in that, um, I finished up uh, doing a major in finance and banking and, um, um, you know, I got through that okay, but uh, graduating in the early 90s, it was a pretty tough job market. Um, the corporate sector in Perth was... Uh, was a lot smaller than it is now and, and uh, like a lot of services in Perth, um, probably over-serviced. Um, while I was studying, I'd, I'd worked a few different part-time jobs uh, like most students, everything from retail to a little bit of tutoring. Um, I really enjoyed rowing and I kept rowing competitively. Um, I worked on the Rottnest Ferries uh, part-time and um, when I finished my degree, I, I wasn't sure what to do, but an opportunity came up uh, actually with my brother to take a motor yacht that had been built in Perth and we sailed, um, sailed that to Europe and I, I stayed away for, for some time working. 
but before I'd left, I'd, I'd sent in an application to National Australia Bank um, uh, for work, and I hadn't really heard anything back. But while I was away, they rang my parents and um, just to find out what I was doing, and word sort of filtered over to uh, France, where I was, that you know there was a job there if I wanted to come back. And um, you know, again, a little bit of a fork in the road, but I, I thought it might be time to come back and. Um, get a job, use my degree, and, you know, felt like perhaps coming back to a real job, whether that was the case or not. Um, that's what I did. Um, uh, coming back, I, I started as a, tr a trainee with National Australia Bank, and um, I basically learned everything from uh, being a bank teller, um, counting money, loading a flexi teller, um, you know, helping customers, setting up accounts, and, you know, a lot of it was quite mundane, but but I did feel like they were a, a good company to work for and it, it was interesting and I, I did feel like I was learning some things but, you know, it was a very... Um, training bags back then were quite bureaucratic, big, thick manuals and everything had to be done by the book, very process-driven. Um, and to be honest, that probably wasn't my strong point but, but I found myself um, after a couple of years uh, in a lending role and, and I really enjoyed that because, um, you know, I got to see a lot of different businesses and different clients and um, the, good, the good, the bad and the ugly of business, what goes well, what goes wrong. Um, and, you know, I was, I was starting to learn a lot. Um, while I was doing that, I, I thought I'd, I'd better go back and do a bit more study. Again, not quite sure what I wanted to do, but I, I did a Securities Institute course um, in finance. And... Um, after about three years at NAB, I was walking through London Court with uh, another good Parry House man, Rob George, uh, who Dave and I went to school with, and he was working in recruitment, and he happened to say, oh, I'm trying to fill a job at Macquarie. Uh, if they're opening up a new real estate area, and, and I'm having trouble filling this job. Do you know anyone? And um, I, I said to him, yeah, me. Um, uh, you know, I, I reckon that sounds great. And he said, oh, do you know anything about property? And I thought, oh, well, what's there to know? Yeah, I, enough I think um, and uh, that afternoon I, I dusted off the CV and, and sent it to Rob and I had an interview the next day and um, I guess that, that uh, for me is um, one of the important uh, aspects of entrepreneurial spirit which is um, you, you have to be on the lookout for opportunities you never quite know when they come up and, and I guess you've got to be uh, ready to take them when they come up um, for me, it was a little bit of luck, but I found myself working at Macquarie in Perth. Um, I worked there for about 10 years and um, left, left as a division director in Sydney. Um, we, we lent money, we invested money. And, um, you know, Macquarie back then was a, you know, really great Australian financial company. It still is. I learned a lot about, um, well, I worked with a lot of great people. I was a very disciplined organisation. Um, but I learned a lot about risk and uh, pricing risk and what risk was okay to take, how to mitigate risks. So it was a lot of lending and investing. Um, and again, just dealing with a wide range of people in different activities around the country. You know, it was a great way to learn. So I'm, I'm now involved uh, in, in a business I've been in for about 10 years with, with my brother. And... Um, I, we, we bought a business about 10 years ago that was an existing business a guy had started. Um, we sell filters and spare parts for machinery. And um, I, I guess some of those things I'd learned along the way in banking and finance um, helped us when we bought the business, even though we didn't know much about the, the particular products. I'm not a machinery guy or an engineering guy, but, but we learned very quickly. And um, I think some of the things I learned in banking um, that that were very useful were, um, you know, just really learning about money, how to, how to handle it, how to borrow it, how to lend it, how to get repaid, um, what happens when you don't get repaid, what happens when people steal. Um, I got held up when I was working at National Bank as a young, uh, a young teller. Um, I, had, I worked with a staff member who, was, um, who turned out to steal money from the bank. So that, these are all sort of um, kind of hard, interesting life experiences that you don't forget. Um, but, but later in life, some of those things that you take for granted at the time really come back and, and are actually quite useful. Um, so anyway, long story short, we, we're involved in, in a business now. As I said, we sell spare parts. Um, 
So that was an existing business that we've grown. And uh, along the way, we've, we've added some things. We've become a distributor for a, a brand of engine from Japan. Um, we, we import filters and uh, we distribute different things. Um, most of what I do day to day now is talking to people, um, staff, customers. We try and stay really close to people, suppliers, uh, partners. We've got a partner in our engine business from Singapore. And um, what I really enjoy now is just looking out for, for new products and, and things we can bring to Australia. <coughs> so what the industry we're in is really quite traditional and very mature, but you know, sometimes by taking a product from another market or, uh, or something new and novel from somewhere else, um, you know, we can bring that back, back to our market here. Or, or it might just be a different way of selling an existing product. Um, we've now got about 13,000 products on our website for sale. We sell products around, uh, all, all around Australia. Um, so, um, you know, if I think back to my time at Hale, I, I, as I said, I had no real idea what I'd be doing. But, um, you know, I, I found myself following things that interested me and, um, you know, I enjoy now um, what we do today uh, as much as anything I've ever done in my work life. And, and we have a lot of fun, you know, a lot of hard work, but, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it's been a, a good ride since uh, leaving Hale. Um, if anyone's around after, afterwards for a cup of tea, it'd be great to uh, talk further. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, James Mulholland, as it says here, uh, left Hale 19 years ago, so um, 2000, and it's, uh, it, it, it's pretty cool to be asked back uh, today, to be honest with you. Um, this room did not look like this. There were spit balls on the roof and a few other changes have happened since then, but I, I did sit here and I um, listened to a gentleman called uh, Charlie Gunningham. A few of you may, uh, may have heard of him before uh, from <coughs> Business News, but previous to that, he had an uh, online business um, which he since sold to, I believe it was realestate.com. Uh, so a very successful uh, entrepreneur. Um, so it's quite special for me to be able to stand here and tell you that story um, and talk to you for a little bit. Um, a couple of questions came to us from uh, Stephen. You know, what's the definition of uh, entrepreneur entrepreneurialism um, and what does it mean for me? And I had to actually jump on wi wiki quickly um, <laughs> because it, it's a term I think that's thrown around quite a bit. Um, Wiki says it's the process of designing, launching and running a new business. I do and don't disagree with that. Uh, I think um, for me personally I haven't uh, technically or uh, done a lot of designing and launching um, but what I have done is acquired businesses and then developed that business, found a new product, evolved the business, um, continued on with current trends. So I think it's very, very important um, to know the definition there. Um, I think also, if I was to define it, it would be working uh, on the business rather than in the business. I think it's very important that um, a business owner doesn't go along and buy a business and then work within the business. I think uh, you need to get out of the day-to-day, -day, look at your business, what can you improve, um, how can you service your clients better. Um, key skills, competencies for being successful. Well, where do you start? It's a bit of everything. Um, business makes you hard. Uh, everyone is out there to essentially... Uh, People are trying to sell stuff to you. They're trying to make money off you. So you, ha you learn to be very hard. Employees, we spoke about, um, uh, Nick spoke about theft. Um, it's, it's, business is very difficult from, from all aspects. You have to um, be able to look at every option in front of you, um, assess each, assess the risks on each option, and then just pick one that you believe is going to be get you to where you want to end up and accept that decision, stand by it, and move on. The decision might not be right, but a good entrepreneur, I think, will then own that decision, learn from that decision, and uh, not make it again. Um, I'm dyslexic. Um, I didn't do TE, so I didn't go to university. Um, that hasn't really affected me at all. Um, I employ a very good executive assistant, and she spell checks everything before I send it. <laughs> um, uh, also, uh, other skills, the ability to um, uh, to delegate, I think, is very important as well. And I mentioned before, not working uh, in your business, working on your business. So, employ people, let them do the job that they're employed to do, employ the right people, and look at how you can improve your business. Um, very briefly, uh, left school for a work placement program in year 12 uh, onto the Rottnest Ferries. 
um, been on and off the rice ferries for many years and um, seven years ago uh, acquired uh, Hillary's Fast Ferries or Rottnest Fast Ferries as it is now. So a bit of a, a, a school dream. So, you know, thankful to Hale for um, that work placement. Um, got some marine qualifications on the ferry, um, then uh, went to work for a gentleman called Peter Printable, um, driving his uh, private boat here in Perth. And when I was doing that, um, people would call me up, oh, can you work on this boat, can you work on that boat? Um, and obviously there's only one of me that ever could, so I started ringing mates, can you work on this boat, can you work on that boat? And that sort of led to my first um, business, if you will, I called it Cruise WA, um, and essentially it was very niche, um, supplying crew to local charter boats uh, in Perth, all the um, cray boats you see running up and down the river, e even Captain Cook Cruises used to supply crew to them. Labour hire business, it was a great business, um, prof probably saw a better profit margin from that business than anything else I've had. Um, after that, um, bought what was Swan Jet Adventures, um, the jet boat on the Swan River. Uh, had that for about six, seven years. Um, moved from that into Rottnest Fast Ferries. Um, very, very lucky to acquire that. Um, it wasn't on the market. The owners were uh, old and retiring. Um, had that, as I say, for seven years now. Um, we've doubled our uh, patronage and obviously increased our market share, which has been a huge thing for us. Um, during that uh, phase, we bought into a company called Adams Coach Lines, Adams Pinnacle Tours. Uh, you may have seen the blue and white buses around town. Uh, we bought in small increments into that business and just recently in February um, bought out the founding uh, director, Adam Barnard. Um, it's a challenge. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big, 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 big challenge. Um, uh, daily, um, you have to... Um, you have to be resilient, you have to pick your fights, um, you can't do everything at once. Um, you have to, as I said before, put people in those jobs, allow them to do those jobs. You have to be very good at cash flow management. Cash is king and all these gentlemen here um, will tell you that. If you don't have cash, uh, you're nothing. Be friendly with your bank manager too. Um, Uh, with uh, sorry, with, so with the Adams products, talked about not buying business, um, working on your business. So the ferries, once again, uh, doubled our patronage by developing the products. So made more products on the island, um, got involved in the buses, um, bought a fleet of 200 hire bikes. Um, we started doing a coastal cruise on one of the ferries during its downtime. Um, kept developing that product, um, teed up with a helicopter company and did what we call the heli heli package, so you fly one way by helicopter, come back by ferry. Um, the Adams uh, business, we're going to do the same thing. So Adams operates uh, coaches statewide, um, Broome, Darwin, uh, all up and down, Coral Coast, through to Albany, uh, Esperance. We do pretty much everything. We do some pretty cool stuff too. Um, very unusual stuff, we carry prisoners. So once a week we run down to Albany and back with prisoners, and once a week we run out to Kalgoorlie and back with prisoners. Just uh, never ever would have thought that I'd go from sitting in these seats to um, standing here operating the business as we are. Um, there are challenges in our business. Um, once again, we're just going to look at the business, develop the business, what can we improve, what can we change. Um, I said cash flow is king. Um, you know, I've got a business that's quite uh, um, debt ridden at the moment. So obviously uh, cash flow um, management is uh, very important for us at the moment. Um, Parting sort of words, um, back yourselves. Um, my, my parents, um, business people, strongly uh, respect them. Um, I've been against their guidance um, a couple of times. It's certainly failed a couple of times, but it's certainly succeeded a couple of times. So um, if you want to be an entrepreneur, um, you can do it. That's my story. Thanks for listening. Right, well, hi everyone. My name's Steve. Um, so, where do we start? I uh, went to Curtin University, studied engineering. Um, they say the hardest, one of the hardest things you can do is get an engineer to talk about himself. So, we'll see how I go. Um, so, basically, I, I spent 16 years uh, as a control systems engineer. Um, control systems are basically what uh, in terms of what I do, I, I work in the mining industry and 
I basically control all the conveyors, crushes, pumps, whatever. We write software to make all that stuff work. Um, so I've been doing it for quite a long time. Um, I've worked for large engineering companies um, and another fairly large mining company, which you might have heard of. This is from WA. Um, so basically, <coughs> you get to a point where you... Um, I always had an idea in the back of my mind about I'd like to start a, start a company. I never really did much about it, but um, yeah, I saw an opportunity arise where there was a guy in a sort of similar position as me, and we said, well, hey, we're both, um, we're both senior engineers, and what's next for us? I guess the career path is um, once you get to a senior engineer level, there's not too, not too many technical levels above that. You can be a lead engineer, which is... Um, there's not too many of them going around, so we thought, well, let's start a company and see how we go. Um, I sort of just knew, I just, um, we just sort of knew it would work. I don't know how I knew that, but we just knew. Um, anyway, so basically, yeah, we got emailed some questions about this talk, and one of them was, what does entrepreneurial mean to you? Um, so our business, <coughs> plus on that, I'm a founder and director of that business there, Tier 16. So our business, um, we sell engineering hours, is basically all what we sell, that's our product. And we're always trying to find ways to add value, as um, Nathaniel said. How do we, how do we, how do we uh, add value to our, our, uh, our clients? So you might think, well, we just you know, provide a quote and that's what we do. But what we really, what with the, entre the entrepreneurial aspect of that is that um, it's not only finding the issues that the client has, but it's finding the issues that they don't know they've got and trying to find solutions to those issues. Um, so that's, that's sort of what it means to me is, you know, I do a lot of software and I'm, I'm in the code a lot and uh, you can see things in software and you go, well, we know, I know that's not quite right. So how do we, how do we raise that to, to a client and say, well, here's a, here's, a, here's a bit of software that I know doesn't work. You probably don't know it doesn't work properly. How do we raise it into a business opportunity where we can then say, well, here's something we can fix, you know, um, and we can, we can take it from there. Um, one of the key skills of being an entrepreneur is um, your relationship with your clients. Um, you don't have to be the smartest person um, out there, but you have to maintain good relationships with your clients. Um, basically, once, once you've sold your idea, to the client, obviously then the technical skill comes in after that. You um, need to be able to deliver on what you say you're going to deliver. Um, but initially in that initial um, contact, it's, it's more about keeping keeping relationships with your, with your clients. Um, in our case, there was two of us that started this company up. Um, I'm more the technical guy, the other guy is the salesman. So I, f I found that in our case, Having a partnership with two people with different personalities worked a lot for us. Um, so my business partner is the salesman. Um, he's the one that, that makes the deals and, and tells all the clients that, yep, yep, we can do whatever you want, we can do it all. And then he handballs the problems to me and I've got to figure it out. <laughs> um, another part of being an entrepreneur is that um, you kind of need a plan B, I find. Um, and in fact, when we started this company up, it was better that we, we actually, we, uh, we got our plan B happening while plan A was happening uh, at the same time. So we're working on our plan A, which is building our business up. We've actually got a, basically an income stream coming in um, so that we can maintain our, uh, our ideas over here. We've still got money coming in to keep the mortgage paid off. Um, that's really about it. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Brett. I'm a marketing consultant. I do content and strategy. And I also have a startup uh, that's called Stake Something. And um, it's a platform for what we call behavior hacking, um, a way of changing your behavior. 
and it works like this. You pick a goal and then you put some of your own money at stake. And at the end of the week, if you've done what you said you were going to do, you get your money back. And if you don't, it goes to charity. So um, seems to be the case that this works for about 80% of people. Uh, so we think we're really on to something here. And um, our next step is to raise $200,000 um, from an angel investor. So that's um, our project. I wanted to start by saying um, I've had a pretty patchy, largely unsuccessful career as an entrepreneur. Um, so I'm not your inspirational guy, right? Um, <laughs> I, I want to say to you that it might not go the way that you want and I want to talk about that a little bit later on. Um, but I want to begin by saying I run our school reunions and every five years um, you know, we meet up and you get a sense for where people are in life. So I can tell you that uh, the people who have been uh, successful in the entrepreneurial space, um, the people who've made the most money, um, tend not to come from the top class in school. Uh, and in fact, the guy who was the second most successful guy financially in our year group uh, was in the bottom class at school. Uh, the guy who was the most successful financially by a long way in our year, um, he dropped out of school at 15 and uh, actually spent a number of months living on the streets. So it is no disadvantage to you if you're not a great student, it's probably an advantage. Um, myself, um, I, did a, uh, I did a business degree uh, because I thought if you're interested in business, that's what you had to do. Uh, that's not true. Um, technical skills, analytical skills, coding, science, manual skills, even an arts degree, they're all absolutely valid platforms for you to become uh, an entrepreneur. Uh, so you should, in my mind, you should do whatever you're most interested in, uh, study that, and then you can always tack an MBA onto the end of that uh, if you have the need. So um, my, I guess the main point I wanted to, to suggest is, is, is around this. You have a, an environment that you're brought up in and you respond to that environment and you you create a personality for yourself and a worldview. And that's already done, that's baked in by the time you're 16, you guys have already got that. Um, however, uh, it's unlikely that the way you are um, includes all of the attributes you need to survive being an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about you know, resilience and persistence and people skills and flexibility, uh, importantly, because almost every successful startup had to pivot. Um, YouTube started as a dating site. Uh, Groupon started as a charity social network. Um, Shopify started as um, selling um, snowboards online. Um, at some point, those founders had to give up their original idea about what they were going to do um, and, and jump in and try something completely different. And, and that's a skill that you're going to need. So you start as an entrepreneur and you've got an idea of what, what, it, look, what it looks like and you think it's only going to go one way, but it won't. Um, and you think you can't fail, but you can. Um, so um, if, like me, you, you established for yourself an identity of I'm going to be a successful entrepreneur, um, at some point, pretty quick, you're going to have to deal with the fact that you're not successful. And your identity is going to have something to say about that. And what I mean by that is that there's going to be a little voice in your head that says something like, um, well, that was embarrassing. Um, don't do that again. Or um, you can't trust business partners. Or um, never borrow money again. Right, so um, I, I know in my case uh, it took about 12 years for me to have another crack after my first uh, entrepreneurial failure. Uh, and I, I have some advice for you about that. Uh, and that is um, I recommend you as soon as you can 
go and do a personal development course. And um, if you do that, you'll learn to be coachable and importantly, you will learn to separate your emotional attachment to your project from the project itself. And one of the other benefits of that is that when you, um, you won't, you won't hate yourself when you fuck it up, as you invariably will. So um, you won't get that training at school, you don't get it in the workforce, uh, you don't get it at university, you're gonna have to seek it out <coughs> and it costs money, but it's a really great investment in my view. Um, I know that um, it's accepted wisdom in startup um, circles all around the world at the moment that the root cause of all startup failures is the same. Uh, does anyone know what that is? No. <laughs> nice try. No cigar. No. The, the root cause of all failures of startups is the founder. So you should be working on that. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much to the old boys. Uh, if I can ask Helen if you would like to take the old boys to the maid administration and we can all join them for a cup of tea, coffee and a biscuit. I'll just finish up with uh, a few takeout points um, that I had. Uh, thanks very much, fellas. And these are probably in no particular order. Um, I thought informal learning. So, fellas, when you're sitting in here, th that notion that you're going to be continually learning throughout your lifespan is something that, be that has become very predominant probably in the last couple of years. Um, learning from your failures as much as you learn from your successes. I think they, most of the speakers spoke about passion, adaptability. I genuinely liked, and David mentioned this, um, about treating clients with human dignity. I think uh, respect, whilst the very old traditional type thing, never goes out of fashion. Um, that notion of networking, uh, learning from those life experiences and putting them into play in different circumstances. Uh, James mentioned this notion of accepting the challenges and you will have many challenges over your lifespan. Um, Stephen Toth talked about finding solutions and I thought the, the one that I liked that, that Brett mentioned there um, was about flexibility. I think you young fellas that are sitting in here, when you transition out of school now, you've got to be very flexible. You must be adapt adaptable. Yes, your degree or your trade or whatever you decide to do will take you so far, but it's all those concurrent sorts of things that you're doing at Hale, so your service learning, uh, your PSA sport, Continue to do those things throughout your lifespan. That is where you get to expand your network. You have the old Halians network. Um, just on Nathaniel, uh, for the year 12 sitting on the room, uh, not that you know it yet, but on September 6 at lunch, my dream is that all 202 of you will turn up. Uh, Nathaniel will be coming back and running a seminar to set up your own LinkedIn account. Um, which I think is fairly good. We've got a number of boys going through the apprenticeship application process, for example, at the moment. Um, and that they've signed up to program and BHP and Woodside so that they get notifications about the opportunities that are coming up. Um, it is probably not a tool that everyone that's in here is using. Um, is it Insta? I don't know. I don't use it myself. Uh, but look, on the September 6th, year 12s, You'll be asked at lunch to probably, uh, are we coming to the lecture theatre or the MAD? We're not sure, um, but I hope you turn up, take the opportunity to create a LinkedIn account um, and then hook into the uh, old Halians, young Halians at a minimum and any other institutions or employers that you might be interested in for the future. Um, as I said, if, you, if you'd like to come and have a cup of tea or coffee and chat with the old boys, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we'll see you next door. Cheers.